Welcome to Songs for Your Consideration. In this series, we will use a song as a jumping off point in order to talk about an artist, a genre, or a broader idea. Today's episode is all about Jackie by Sinead O'Connor. Jackie left on a cold at night, telling me he'd be home. Sail the seas for a hundred years, leaving me all alone. But to truly appreciate this song, we need to learn more about Sinead herself. Sinead Marie Bernadette O'Connor was born in County Dublin on the 8th of December 1966. Sinead's parents, Sean and Marie O'Connor, separated when she was eight years old. Sinead's mother was granted custody of her and her siblings. Her father fought for custody of the children, eventually gaining it five years later when Sinead was 13. During that five-year period, Sinead and her siblings were subject to abuse from their mother. Sinead described this abuse as emotional, physical and sexual. This abuse would end up having a significant, awful, lingering impact on her life. How did she hurt you? How did she hurt you inside? Kicking me, kicking me, and kicking me, and kicking me, and kicking me. And telling me I'm evil, and telling me I shouldn't have been born, and I'm the reason my father left. It's my fault. After getting caught shoplifting, Sinead was sent to a Magdalene Asylum, better known as a Magdalene Laundry. These institutions were run by nuns, who would use abusive methods on the girls staying there. The justification for this cruel torture was that they were attempting to reform the girls for their past crimes. Allegedly, these were originally set up by the Roman Catholic Church to house prostitutes in order to rehabilitate them, hence the name Magdalene. Instead, 30,000 fallen women in Ireland were sent to these laundries for other reasons, such as committing petty crimes, like shoplifting in Sinead's case, exhibiting sexually deviant behaviour, like flirting, getting pregnant out of wedlock, or simply being born disabled. Some of these victims never left. Well over 100 unmarked graves have been discovered near the Magdalene laundries, as well as around 800 infant bodies of children aged between three weeks and three years that were stuffed in a septic tank and thrown into a mass grave. Sinead described her time as being treated more like a prisoner. In spite of this, it was here that her interest in music and writing really blossomed. She began recording at this time, even completing a four-track EP. She also formed the band Ton Ton Makut as a singer. Named after the Haitian paramilitary force, they were inspired by world music. Sinead briefly went to Newtown School in Waterford, but later dropped out and moved to Dublin with the band. However, it was at this time when Sinead was debating starting a career in music at only 17 years old, that Sinead's mother died in a car accident. Her reaction to this death was difficult as she felt grief and mourning for her mother, whilst also feeling relieved and happy that her old abuser was dead. Without even thinking, what do you love about your mother? The first thing that came to my mind actually is that she's dead, which is a very strange thing to come to mind, but I love about my mother that she's dead. I think it was very kind of her. Although I miss her horribly, uh, I really ache for her. And I think that's part of where my suicidal instinct comes from, is that I want my mother. But I cannot wait until the day that I naturally get to heaven so that I can see my mother again. Later, Sinead was convinced to leave the band behind and instead go forth on her own as a solo artist. Sinead began working on her first album, The Lion and the Cobra. The title comes from Psalm 9113, which reads, You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. This title evokes imagery of faith, allowing someone to overcome terror and negativity in their lives. Clearly these words moved O'Connor, especially since she has strong faith, and we see a lot of religious imagery in her music. Recording this album was described as a very intense time. O'Connor's music was her medicine, putting so much of herself in what she was doing, and so at times, the recording process could cause her a lot of pain but it could also help heal her. The album was released in 1987 and was a big hit in both the UK and in the US, even earning her a Grammy nomination for Best Female Rock Vocal Performance, which she actually lost to Tina Turner, who had just won the award for the fourth consecutive time. So let's talk about the first song in the record, Jackie. Oh man, there's so many reasons to love this song. So um, 
starting with the lyrics, it's a ghost story and it describes this woman um, who is waiting for her lover, her Jackie, to return from sea and he never does. And she's sort of in denial and, you know, can't sort of emotionally move past this. So she's just walking up and down the beaches, just waiting. And then her body, I guess, kind of sort of vaporizes, kind of disappears, but her soul lingers and she's sort of stuck in the earth, haunting it um, as a ghost, just waiting forever for her, her Jackie to return. Um, and it's, it's beautiful. It's really, really haunting. It's, it's great. Jackie left on a cold, dark night, telling me he'd be home. Sailed the seas for a hundred years, leaving me all alone. And I've been dead for 20 years, and I've been washing the sand with my ghostly tears, searching the shores for my Jackie O. As the song goes on, the lyrics give us some more details. I remember the day the young man came. He said, your Jackie's gone, we got lost in the rain. And I ran to the beach and laid me down. You're all wrong, I said, and they stared at the sand. That man knows that sea like the back of his hand. He'll be back sometime, laughing at you. She's clearly just unable to make sense of this tragedy and flat out refuses to accept it. Then the final verse of the song just retreads the first verse. And I've been waiting all this time for my man to come take his hand in mine and lead me away to unseen shores. I've been washing the sand with my salty tears, searching the shore for these long years. And I'll walk the seas forevermore. The song ends with her desperately crying out for him, repeating, till I find my Jackie O. Then finally, just his name, Jackie O. I think these lyrics are beautiful. And I think what makes them so effective is uh, how simple they are and how subtle they are. So the song is kind of a love song and a tragedy at the same time. So in terms of it being a love song, it's pretty clear how how devoted she is, how in love with her Jackie she is, and how heartbroken she is at the idea of him being gone. And she literally can't imagine her life without him, which plays into the fact of why it's such a tragedy. Here she is, ironically doomed to wait forever without him because she can't accept the idea of living without him. Haunting, really, really sad, really, really lovely. Just beautiful. I suppose a similar story that's maybe more universally known would be Seymour waiting for Fry in the Futurama episode, Jurassic Bark. It beautifully captures the love between humans and dogs, whilst also being a tear-jerking tragedy happening in slow motion. Both stories are very similar thematically, except Jurassic Bark is about being isolated in the future and the love between man and his best friend, whereas Jackie is about haunting a beach and the love between a woman and her husband. The lyrics also call to mind Ireland's most famous ghost, the Banshee. The Banshee is a female spirit that's found in Irish legends. The Banshee is associated with death, but they don't actually bring death. Instead, they forewarn it. A Banshee's high-pitched shrieks and cries are said to be heard by a family member just before someone dies. Legend says that the Banshee is only heard by families of pure Irish descent, and it's connected to five great Irish families. The O'Briens, the O'Grady's, the O'Neill's, the Cavanaugh's, and the O'Connor's. At its core, the song is a singer-guitarist performance. This is especially highlighted in some live renditions, which feature just Sinead with a microphone backed by an acoustic guitar. The guitar has a steady, driving strumming pattern, playing these chords. The chords played by the guitar are power chords, and notably, the D chord changes from feeling like a D major or D minor, depending on the vocal melody. Adding the third interval that would make it major or minor doesn't really sound correct, and instead, it's the uncertainty that adds to the atmosphere of the song. Interestingly, the first verse of the song adds a G chord, which never happens again. I find this very intriguing. There's a sense that O'Connor really specifically wanted the first verse to be slightly different. This additional G chord could work in every verse, as would leaving it out. The melody doesn't change, just the harmony underneath. I don't think this is accidental. Now, this is entirely conjecture, since I'd need her to answer this herself to know what she was truly thinking. But 
I envisioned that when she was strumming the song out, she considered switching every two verses or at certain points, but it only truly worked in the first verse. Even from my point of view, when I was playing this song as research for this video, I found that when I tried to add the G chord in, it just sounded wrong in certain places. For example, I tried adding it to the third verse from the I ran to the beach, and when I added it, it just sounded a little bit off. It sounded incorrect. Furthermore, this means the first verse has four chords. Then it switches to three chords for the next few verses. Finally, the outro has two chords until it ends on the tonic chord. Counting down, four chords, three chords, two chords, one chord. It's as if the underlying harmony is compressing and the song is doing more with even less. Often, it's the subtle changes and the attention to detail that separates good songwriters from great ones. Aside from guitar and vocals, the song features what I believe is a mix of synthesizers and electric guitar feedback in order to achieve a dark and droning backing for the lead instruments. The song builds and builds in a linear fashion, dynamically getting louder and musically growing more and more unbalanced and unhinged until it finally explodes at the end. Vocally, this song is stunning. Sinead O'Connor has a voice like no one I've ever heard. There's so much rawness and passion in what she's doing, so much emotion, but yet so much power and control, even even live. She's able to pull this off. And, you know, usually if you want to put that much emotion in your performance, some of the pitch and intonation and stuff will, will struggle, will suffer. Um, but you sort of sacrifice those things for the emotion. Or you can be a very technically gifted singer. But she manages to do both. It's basically just like the two best parts of the human voice. So like on one level, the human voice might be one of the most emotional ways to express yourself because it's a way that most of us um, communicate and you're essentially not abstracting it with um, a guitar or a piano or an orchestra. It's coming straight from you and here you are expressing yourself in like the most direct way possible. So it's really relatable for people listening. Um, and that can be some of the most emotive music. But at the same time, Sinead O'Connor manages to treat the human voice as like an instrument in its own right. So the amount of, as I said, pitch and intonation, the amount of technical skill going into this is just absolutely astounding. It's an absolutely incredible performance. Again, not even just the one on the record, which is amazing, but live as well. You can see some, you know, incredible performances. I would definitely recommend checking those out as well if you enjoyed this song. Stunning. Absolutely stunning. Jackie is a perfect example of a song that when it ends, I have to fight all temptation not to just start it all over again. It just, it could loop forever, you know. Um, But luckily, the rest of the album, The Lion and the Cobra, is really good. Um, So when Mandinka kicks in afterwards, it kind of makes it a little bit, um, little bit easier to move on. The Lion and the Cobra was a big success, critically and commercially with Mandinka and Troy being the biggest hits from the record. She continued this momentum with her second album, I Do Not Want What I Haven't Got. The second single off of this album, Nothing Compares to You, written by Prince, was one of the best-selling singles of the 90s. The music video was very minimalist, mainly consisting of a tight close-up of Sinead singing the song. When Sinead performs the lines, All the flowers that you planted, Mama, in the backyard, all died when you went away. I know that living with you, baby, was sometimes hard, but I'm willing to give it another try. Nothing compares. Nothing compares to you. We see a tear roll down her cheek. This wasn't planned or scripted. The lyrics and the performance overwhelmed her. She felt herself on the verge of crying, and as she put it, I let it happen. Sinead O'Connor was now a star, beloved and revered by both critics and fans. Although, this picture-perfect pop star persona that was thrust upon her was already starting to show cracks. Sinead O'Connor's voice helped her become a household name. Now she was going to use that same voice to say what she felt needed to be said. And permanently discredited. Despite the mainstream success, Sinead O'Connor was far from your typical pop sensation. For a start, her signature look famously included a shaved head. Sinead explained that when she was a child, she described her sister as having beautiful bright red hair. However, their mother didn't like it, describing it as horrible and disgusting. Her mother would call Sinead her beautiful daughter and call Sinead's sister her ugly daughter. Sinead 
angered by this, decided to shave her hair off. In addition to this, Sinead has also said that she wanted her hair shaved as a way of protecting herself. She was terrified of being sexually assaulted and so chose to have a more androgynous, less conventionally attractive look. As Sinead said it herself, I didn't want to be a f***ing pop star, thanks very much. I wanted to be a protest singer. And protest she did. Sinead O'Connor's outspoken and uncompromising antics landed her in hot water repeatedly. Sinead's explosion into fame caused a lot of stress on her mental health. She was nominated for various awards for her music, such as Grammys. She rejected these awards and wouldn't attend the ceremonies because she felt she didn't deserve them. In a similar vein, O'Connor made the headlines when she refused to sing the US national anthem before a performance at Garden State Arts Centre. The centre had a policy of singing the Star Spangled Banner before every event, but Sinead felt national anthems had nothing to do with music. This was not specific to the US. She had a blanket ban on all national anthems before her shows, including the Irish anthem. Eventually, the venue caved and allowed her to perform without the inclusion of the Star Spangled Banner, but this didn't stop the mass uproar that followed it. Although, this controversy was pale in comparison to her infamous Saturday Night Live performance. On the 3rd of October 1992, Sinead O'Connor was invited to perform as a musical guest on an episode of SNL. During the dress rehearsal, Sinead performed an a cappella cover of Bob Marley's War, at the end of which she held up a photo of a starving child as she said the word evil. The protest was deemed acceptable by the executive producer, Lorne Michaels, and so she was given the go-ahead. However, during the actual live performance, she went off script, and this happened instead. Until that day, there is no continent which will know peace. Children, children, fight. We find it necessary. We know we will win. We have confidence in the victory of good over evil. Fight the real enemy. Sinead changed the word racism to child abuse. She replaced the photo of a starving child with a photo of Pope John Paul II. She then tore the photo into pieces and said, fight the real enemy, and then threw the pieces at the camera. The atmosphere in the studio after this was tense. The on-set director decided to leave the applause sign off, so the audience barely made a sound. There was no applause, cheering, or booing. Just silence. Possibly hard to believe nowadays, but at the time, this was a massive scandal. In 1992, the view of the Catholic Church was very different. This was 10 years before the allegations of priests sexually abusing children was being reported globally on the news. Sinead's live protest of the church and child abuse became a public spectacle. Many people watching the show were outraged. Even Frank Sinatra weighed in, saying that he wanted to kick her in the ass and allegedly also advised her to leave the country due to her actions being unforgivable. He added, for her sake, we'd better never meet. A week later, on the next episode of Saturday Night Live, Joe Pesci held up the photo of the Pope that Sinead had torn up, but with it taped back together. I mean, why should I let it bother me, right? It wasn't my show, it was Tim Robbins' show. (laughs) But I'll tell you one thing, she was very lucky it wasn't my show. Because if it was my show, I would have gave her such a smack. Thirteen days after her SNL performance, Sinead was due to perform at a Bob Dylan 30th anniversary concert, along with Neil Young, Tom Petty, George Harrison, Stevie Wonder, among others. Chris Christopherson went to introduce Sinead, saying, I'm real proud to introduce this next artist, whose name became synonymous with courage and integrity. Ladies and gentlemen, Sinead O'Connor. This was immediately met with booing from the audience. The booing was so loud, it drowned out O'Connor and the onstage band, who were meant to be performing a rendition of Dylan's song, I Believe in You. 
Yeah, she got booed, didn't she? Yeah, I went out. I, uh, they told me to get her off the stage, and I said, I'm not about to do that. I went out, and I said, don't let the bastards get you down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Turn this up until the philosophy which holds one race superior and another inferior is finally and permanently discredited and abandoned. Everywhere is war until there's no After these controversies, in terms of commercial success, Sinead O'Connor never really hit the same highs as her first two records. Sinead actually claimed that Nothing Compares to You being a massive hit actually did more damage to her than the protests and media hysteria ever did, since she found being a pop star stressful and difficult for her emotionally. If anything, the public image struggles and controversies actually helped her mental health. She was less in the public eye and so could spend more time on herself. Journalists were saying things like she looks hell-bent on destroying her career, rather than saying that she was speaking out against child abuse and sexual abuse. The focus was on continuing her momentum and her success, rather than discussing why this was so important to her, and whether or not what she was saying had any truth to it. She was clearly willing to risk all she had worked for for this cause. She was willing to sacrifice her career to stop the abuse of children by the church. The SNL performance is now seen in a different light. Hindsight is indeed 2020. The event that everyone had chastised her for has aged like fine wine. A decade later, in 2002, the Boston Globe Spotlight team reports about Catholic priests and the sexual abuse of minors would start coming out, confirming what O'Connor had said. NBC News in depth tonight, crisis in the church, the Catholic community in Massachusetts dealing now with an ugly secret that's been hidden for far too long, sexual abuse of children by priests. And as NBC's Andrea Mitchell tells us in depth tonight, one of America's best known cardinals is a major figure in this controversy. Say what you will about Sinead O'Connor, but she's an uncompromising artist in its truest form. She is totally unique. She continued releasing music with a lot less fanfare than before, and still occasionally hits the headlines. Is she perfect or beyond criticism? Absolutely not. With all love and respect, there have been many times over the 30 years since that Sinead has said or done things that should be questioned and criticised. But she is rarely afraid to speak her mind, and in this way, she is comparable to other artists, such as Kanye West, MIA, or, to a lesser extent, Fiona Apple. She has been diagnosed with bipolar disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder, which may account for some of her outbursts. However, her horrendous struggle with mental health doesn't justify these behaviours, but it may help explain some of them. Sinead's life has always been turbulent. During the recording of her first album, The Lion and the Cobra, she became romantically involved with her producer, John Reynolds. When she was only 19, she became pregnant. Sinead reported that the doctor she saw actually pressured her into getting an abortion in order to save her career. Sinead made the appointment but backed out before going through with it, and her first son, Jake, was born on the 16th of June, 1987. Sinead had three more children after Jake, Roshin, Shane, and Yeshua. Although tragically, in January 2022, Shane was found dead two days after being reported missing from suicide. A week after this, Sinead herself was hospitalized after a series of tweets which seemed to imply that she was feeling suicidal. There's so much more I could say about Sinead O'Connor, in many ways, I feel like I'm only scratching the surface. Getting ordained as a priest, her name changes, universal mother, take me to church, her conversion to Islam, and so on. 
Although, this video wasn't meant to be an all-encompassing documentary covering every aspect of her life. And hopefully the new documentary, Nothing Compares, that just premiered at Sundance, will illuminate even more about her. Instead, I wanted to give a small glimpse into the mind that gave us the song Jackie. I hope after this you know and understand a little bit more about Sinead O'Connor, and I hope you'll go check out that song Jackie. And if you listen to Jackie and you like it, then check out the rest of the line of the Cobra, and then work through the rest of her discography. If you enjoyed this episode of Songs for Your Consideration, be sure to hit that like button and tell me some of your thoughts in the comments below. For more content like this, be sure to hit that subscribe button, and if you want to be notified every time I upload, then hit the bell. I've been BPM Stuff, you've been very considerate. Thank <laughs> you.